The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this virtual version of the workshop on synchronization and timing systems, WSDS. It was, this is our 29th year, and this year is the first time we've ever done it virtually. Thank you for attending. We have an exciting session today. This uh, VWSDS, virtual WSDS webinar series, is being held in place of the annual face-to-face -face WSDS. And this is the third in a series of three in order to, to give uh, some alternative to the face-to-face -to -face WSDS we were having what has actually turned out to be a very exciting way of presenting some of this material to people, focusing on three different topic areas on the three consecutive Wednesdays in May. This is the final one. Today we're focusing on timing security, resilience, and GNSS issues. I want to thank the speakers, particularly Meinberg, for sponsoring this webinar. Uh, I want to let all attendees know that. Uh, you will receive an email with the slides and a link to the recording shortly following today's broadcast. There are going to be two question and answer sessions during this webinar. Please submit your questions via the chat window on your, on your control panel. Um, and just a reminder that, you know, next year we hope to have WSTS 2021 in March in Denver, Colorado. So uh, just a quick introduction to what you're going to be hearing today. Um, I'm, the, I'm the moderator. I'm Mark Weiss. Um, I, I want to thank Kishan Shinoy of Kulsar for being the vice chair and backing me up. Uh, the speakers today will include Karen Van Dyke, the director of PNT and spectrum management of DOT, uh, Heiko Gerstung, managing director of Mindberg. Karen O'Donohue, Director, Internet Trust and Technology Internet Society. Doug Arnold, the Principal Technologist of Meinberg. Josh Clanton and David Hodu, both from IS4S. Uh, Andreas Bausch, the head of the Time Dissemination Working Group of the, uh, the PTB. Um, for those we don't know what PTB is. That's the German version of what NIST is in the United States. Um, and Aki Strosenos, uh, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that right, the member of the technical staff of Spirant. Um, the topics are today going to be discussed are uh, all about this question of resilience, timing resilience, and and GNSS issues. Um, Karen Van Dyke will address the resilient PNT trans for transportation applications. That, that will be uh, very interesting to hear how the DOT is looking into uh, building resilience for our transportation systems. Uh, Meinberg will present uh, their sponsor presentation Thanks to Heiko Gerstung, and, and then we'll move into talking about some security issues. Uh, one in, uh, I think we switched the order, so Karen is going to go first. Time security on uh, specific, mostly NTP and the winding path to deployment. And then Doug Arnold will talk about some security issues in PTP. Um, We'll then move into talking about some GNSS issues. Um, Josh Clanton and David Hodo talking about a, uh, I believe it's an open architecture, according to the abstract, that they're developing for uh, GNSS integrity. Just, I'm very interested to hear. Uh, Andreas Bausch will, will move into talking about a, a service for timing that is based on European GNSS technologies, and we'll end with talking about multipath issues. One of the another major issue with 
getting time directly from GNSS. We, we focus a lot on GNSS because uh, that's how most people get UTC. Next slide, please. So what we're going to see, there are critical timing issues. And as we've seen in our previous two webinars, timing is becoming a critical enabler in many issue, industries. And, and the, the red words on this are the things I want to emphasize is, is many industries are starting to use 5G, smart city, smart grid, finance, broadcast. And uh, today we're going to talk a little about U.S. government efforts to support resilience from our keynote. And uh, the, the biggest, the reason timing is vulnerable, one of the biggest reasons is because timing, particularly for UTC, must be delivered from the source to the user. You can't just get time locally. You've got to deliver time. And that in the process of delivering, there are, there are vulnerabilities. There are places where it can be attacked, attack surfaces, so-called. And so our speakers today will address the issues in both using GNSS for timing, which is the method most used to get UTC, and also in using networks for tizing, timing, such as the uh, precision time protocol or the network time protocol. So uh, with that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Karen Van Dyke, uh, you know, as you see, director of PNP and spectrum management for the Department of Transportation. Karen, over to you, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mark, for that uh, kind introduction, and it's my pleasure to be able to uh, present at this uh, virtual uh, WSTS uh, workshop uh, today. And as Mark indicated, uh, uh, we are very much uh, focused on resilient uh, positioning, navigation, and timing uh, for transportation um, applications, um, and, and certainly uh, the, the broader um, implications for other uh, critical infrastructure uh, applications as well, and uh, very much uh, value our partnership with the Department of Homeland Security and Department of, of Defense uh, in this endeavor. Um, so if you want to go to uh, the next slide. Great, uh, thank you. Um, so as uh, some uh, background, uh, of course, for Department of Transportation, uh, it's all about uh, being able to have uh, re reliable positioning, navigation, and, and, and timing uh, capabilities. And safety um, has always been and always will be the top priority uh, for Department of, of Transportation. Uh, but there's been significant uh, congressional um, interest and motivation on uh, providing a GPS uh, backup and complementary uh, P&T uh, capability and so that uh, very much uh, guides our work um, in this endeavor. Um, so just wanted to uh, to walk through um, some of the, the pieces of, of legislation uh, that are uh, really pertinent uh, to, to our, our ongoing uh, efforts. Uh, so uh, the, the first one is the um, FY17 uh, National Defense Authorization Act that uh, really uh, helps to establish what the needs are for for, for PNT and uh, helps guide guide us uh, when there um, is a disru disruption to the GPS. What what are those uh, requirements for uh, a backup or complementary a PNT capability uh, for critical uh, infrastructure? And so DHS uh, just recently. Uh, within the past couple of weeks, um, uh, published uh, the FY17 uh, NDAA report to, to Congress. Um, so that is available on uh, the gps.gov website as well as on uh, DHS's website. So would encourage uh, everyone to uh, to take a look at that uh, report. Um, and and then the next uh, piece of legislation was the FY18 National Defense Authorization Act uh, that uh, required. Uh, uh, Department of uh, Transportation, Homeland Security, and, and Defense to demonstrate uh, P&T uh, technologies and, and did uh, fortunately appropriate uh, funds uh, to conduct that demonstration. And, and that will be a large uh, part of my talk today in terms of work that's ongoing um, as part of that, that demonstration. 
And then the third uh, piece of, of legislation uh, is to actually procure a, a GPS backup timing uh, capability. Um, so uh, it's known by uh, various uh, uh, names. It was part of uh, the Coast Guard um, authorization in December of 2018. So it's also known as the Frank uh, Lobiondo Coast Guard Authorization Act, um, or probably more uh, well known as the National Timing Resilience and Security Act. I um, mean, what that National Timing uh, Resilience and Security Act uh, does is place the requirement on uh, Secretary of Transportation to uh, to procure a nationwide uh, timing uh, capability as a backup to to GPS, um, but also a capability that can evolve to providing uh, positioning and, and navigation capabilities as well. Um, so, for Department of Transportation, uh, in addition to to timing, uh, certainly a position in, in navigation is is critical um, to our mission with all modes of, of, of transportation uh, requiring that uh, reliable navigation capability. So we very much uh, look forward to uh, working to, to implement uh, that act, but have it informed by the, the prior uh, pieces of legislation and work conducted um, as part of that effort. Uh, next slide. Uh, so, as a way of of, of, of background, um, so it, it uh, was a, a lot of effort to uh, to, to stand um, up the capability to uh, conduct the demonstration, and we very much uh, value the partnership that we had with uh, Homeland Security and Department of Defense um, in being able to conduct the. The, the planning uh, efforts, um, and while uh, there was $10 million uh, appropriated, um, uh, just getting uh, those funds to where they, they needed uh, to be to execute the demonstration uh, took far longer than uh, we had uh, in anticipated. So um, we really appreciate the work that, um, in particular, uh, DHS uh, uh, S&T was able to do uh, in uh, December of 2018 uh, at NASA Langley uh, as well as the uh, uh, Insurance Institute for Highway Safety um, in being able to, to demonstrate uh, several technologies, in particular uh, Wakada, NextNav, and, and uh, uh, Satellas. Um, and we were, uh, from a, a transportation standpoint, able to, to, to build upon that, that work when we were funded um, uh, starting in, in early uh, 2019. The next slide, please. Uh, so in uh, conducting uh, the demonstration from uh, the Department of Transportation uh, effort, uh, we wanted to focus on uh, technologies that were of a, a technology uh, readiness level, TRL, of uh, six or greater, um, and uh, be able to be uh, able to be taken um, out into a field demonstration and, and evaluated. Um, and really spent a fair amount of time putting uh, together uh, scenarios, uh, both two-dimensional and, and three-dimensional, um, and very much with the mindset of uh, the requirements in the National Timing Resilience and Security Act to have a capability that can work um, indoors, underground, um, and design scenarios that will help inform the, the implementation of that act. Um, so. Uh, we worked uh, through our uh, Volpe Center, our Volpe National Transportation System Center um, that's based in Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts, and again, had uh, extensive um, uh, partnership with the, the, the interagency um, in making sure that we were designing uh, you know, scenarios that would uh, really help um, inform the applications, uh, not only for, for timing, but for positioning and, and navigation across the, the diverse number of, of critical infrastructure um, applications that uh, require resilient PNT. And so we um, also uh, looked at where we were going to conduct the demonstration, so we very much wanted to build upon the work that DHS did at uh, NASA Langley a Research Center, um, but also uh, the Volpe Center has done extensive work um, for other uh, uh, sponsors at uh, Joint Base uh, Cape Cod um, in Massachusetts. Um, and then uh, also work very closely with the Coast Guard to uh, uh, stand up uh, 
a use of, of the LORAN uh, transmitter in, in Wildwood, New Jersey, um, and also uh, worked closely with the um, FAA uh, Tech Center in Atlantic City, New Jersey. And uh, I should say we have uh, great support from Department of Transportation uh, leadership, um, in, in particular our uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Research and, and Technology, Diana First Cart Roth. Uh, she joined uh, Department of Transportation in February uh, 2019, so shortly after we were funded to conduct this work, um, and uh, held uh, several uh, roundtables with technology vendors to really understand uh, the various uh, technologies that could uh, help uh, uh, move us down the, the, the path for a resilient uh, PNT and uh, understand, again, the diversity uh, of technologies that, that are out there um, and uh, various uh, perspectives um, on, on the issue, uh, which uh, then led to a request for information uh, that we uh, issued uh, just about a year ago and, and collected. Um, information uh, from, from uh, various uh, vendors just in terms of, of their approaches to uh, help uh, address this issue. And uh, one of the questions that we, we did um, ask as, as part of that RFI was whether uh, technology vendors needed resources uh, from the government in order to uh, fully participate uh, in a demonstration, recognizing that uh, certainly their uh, is time required uh, from engineers to uh, to help support uh, the, the demonstration, you know, travel, um, et cetera. And, and so no surprise, uh, many of the, the, the vendors said, yes, yes, we need, uh, definitely uh, in order to fully support the demonstration do need uh, uh, resources. And so we, we did uh, uh, follow up uh, with uh, another re request uh, last uh, September, uh, particularly um, asking uh, vendors to uh, submit proposals to participate uh, uh, in the demonstration. And uh, it was a very uh, uh, rapid uh, acquisition uh, that was done. So those uh, contracts were awarded uh, late October of last year. Uh, to uh, 11, 11 vendors, and we'll talk a little bit more um, about that. Um, and then we uh, did just recently uh, conduct uh, those those demonstrations, um, and uh, fortunately, were able to uh, complete the demonstrations in in March before um, we largely shifted over to a, a fully uh, telework in, in environment. So we we literally just uh, got got in on, under. Uh, uh, the, the window of closure there. Um, and then in terms of, of uh, next steps, um, we're, we're currently analyzing uh, all of the data that was collected from the demonstration. So uh, for, um, fortunately, I don't have uh, uh, those results uh, to uh, discuss today, but uh, we are working uh, toward that and look forward to uh, presenting uh, those at, at a future uh, opportunity. Uh, but we will, uh, work through the interagency over the, the next uh, few months. Um, so within the, the U.S., we have a space-based uh, positioning, navigation, and timing executive committee um, that's co-chaired by uh, the Deputy Secretary of Transportation and Deputy Secretary of Defense. And we're looking to bring the results um, up to uh, that level, uh, notionally in the August um, timeframe of this year to help uh, make a, a recommendation on, on the way forward to, uh, to implement uh, that National Timing of Resilience and Security Act. Um, and then, of course, we will have a report uh, back to, to Congress um, uh, on the entire um, effort um, and uh, the recommendations on, on the way forward. The next slide, please. Uh, so this just gives uh, all of the, the, the logos uh, for the 11 uh, vendors that were uh, selected to uh, participate as, as part of the, the, the demonstration um, and were under uh, contract to the, the DOT uh, Volpe Center. Uh, next slide, please. And so uh, th this uh, chart lays out um, which location uh, that the vendors uh, uh, demonstrated their technology at and, and uh, 
uh, very much going into the demonstration. We wanted um, all of the, the vendors to uh, demonstrate their technology in the best light uh, possible. Um, and so we uh, uh, left it up to them uh, whether they wanted to demonstrate uh, at NASA Langley or Joint, joint Base uh, Cape Cod. Um, and so uh, you'll see the uh, type of technology. Um, so at NASA Langley, we had our TRX uh, demonstrating a map match capability. Um, also uh, NextNav in, in, in Skyhook uh, with a terrestrial um, RF, uh, Echo Ridge with a satellite-based capability. and uh, lp and and, and uh, seven solutions with a time over fiber. Uh, at Joint Base Cape Cod, we had um, Helen Systems and, and Ursinab, Circo and, and, and Phaser Lab uh, with a terrestrial RF capability and Satellus uh, with a with a satellite based. So that was the the split between the the, the, the two locations. Uh, next slide, please. So to break this down um, a little bit more, so you, you'll see across the, 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 the top, uh, the two locations, uh, uh, LARC is uh, NASA Langley Research Center and then Joint Base Cape Cod, JBCC, um, and then the different uh, types of, of technology. So the, um, the, the map match, which again is uh, TRX, we had uh, two vendors uh, demonstrating a LRAN capability, so um, Helen Systems, uh, which was a, a consortium with a number of, of, of vendors, and including uh, uh, Microsemi and, and um, Harris Corporation and Continental Electronics. Um, and then the second uh, LRAN vendor was Ursinav. Um, we also had um, Circo with uh, a medium frequency and ranging mode or R mode uh, technology, uh, NextNav with uh, a VHF uh, uh, capability, um, and uh, Phaser Lab in, in Skyhook uh, in the uh, Wi Fi uh, 2.4 uh, giga gigahertz band. Uh, moving on to the satellite uh, capability, um, uh, Echo Ridge uh, using uh, the Global Star uh, uh, satellite, so the LEO constellation, and Satellus with the uh, Iridium uh, constellation, and then uh, the, the two uh, PPP uh, fiber objects, uh, OPNT and, and uh, Seven Solutions. And on the right hand uh, side, you see all the all the, ch the check marks. Um, so uh, we had, um, as I mentioned before, wanting to have both uh, a static um, as well as dynamic uh, uh, scenarios, both indoor and, and, and outdoor. And so we did um, execute um, all of that um, at, at both uh, lo locations. And uh, down below, um, it, it just shows how, how aggressive uh, the, the schedule uh, uh, was from the time that uh, we had received funding in, in early uh, 2019 to, to actually uh, conducting the, uh, the demonstration in March of this year. The next slide, please. Uh, so this uh, just shows the the, the layout um, at uh, NASA Langley uh, uh, Research, um, and uh, where uh, the, the data was was collected. Um, so I'm not sure how well all of the, the colors uh, uh, come through, but uh, there's basically the uh, outline for where the the uh, uh, static and, and dynamic uh, position uh, scenarios were were con conducted. Uh, as well as uh, in the, the orange areas where we had a, a UIS for uh, a collection of, of uh, 3D uh, position uh, information. And then we used uh, a, a Hainer, uh, so that's in the magenta area for the, uh, for the indoor um, uh, data collection. Um, and then uh, we also had a, a, a building uh, for uh, uh, the underground uh, integrated uh, a timing uh, a scenario, so that's in the in the, the, the green uh, uh, shaded area. And next slide, please. And uh, this just graphically uh, shows we we um, did have a, a van equipped uh, to uh, collect uh, information. Uh, while all of the vendors uh, participated in, in the demonstration on the government side, we uh, 
uh, did uh, put together the, the data collection. So all of the da data that was uh, collected uh, for the demonstration uh, was uh, uh, done by the government. Um, and we uh, did put together our, our own uh, our reference uh, system um, is, is a baseline uh, to collect the measurements uh, against. And then in the, the lower right, uh, you see the, uh, the UAS that was uh, used for, for the, the 3D uh, scenarios. The next slide, please. Uh, and then uh, this uh, uh, graph shows uh, joint base of Cape Cod and uh, uh, Volpe has 150 um, acres um, at that uh, facility. And uh, so we're very uh, uh, fortunate to, to use that, that facility. And again, uh, similar to uh, uh, NASA Langley in terms of the, the different uh, scenarios that were, were, were conducted. Um, uh, for both the uh, indoor and outdoor and uh, static and, and dynamic uh, uh, scenarios. Next slide, please. And so we had a, a second uh, van that was equipped uh, for the uh, the data collection uh, at Joint Base Cape Cod. And, and again, we used a, a UAS for uh, uh, the 3D uh, positioning uh, data collection. The next slide. Uh, so, in way of uh, summary on the on the on the demonstration, uh, we do have all of the data. Our our team uh, at the Volpe Center is is aggressively working uh, to complete the the analysis. Uh, so you see the timeline along the, the the bottom. So we are looking to have that um, internal data analysis. Uh, completed by the end of this month, and uh, every indication is uh, they are uh, on track with that. Um, and we will um, start the uh, interagency uh, coordination that will uh, lead up to the very uh, senior leadership uh, within uh, the U.S. Uh, government in terms of recommending uh, the, the, the way forward um, uh, later this uh, summer. And so I appreciate um, the partnership, um, uh, all of the technology vendors who uh, participated as part of, of, of this effort, um, I think it was, was very um, successful uh, in, in ter terms of everyone, you know, really rolling up their sleeves and working to, to a very aggressive uh, a, a schedule and, and um, also I really appreciate all the work uh, that our, our Volpe uh, team has done to, to, to keep this on track. Um, and we feel that you know this will be a good way to really um, drive our, our PNT um, strategy as, as we uh, look to, to the future um, and uh, help make an, an interagency uh, recommendation. And I think as, as folks on, on the uh, you know this workshop are, are well aware that uh, there's likely no one solution that can uh, meet everyone's uh, of requirements across uh, positioning, navigation, and, and, and timing. And so it's very much uh, uh, understanding uh, what the needs are. So going back to uh, the work that was done under the FY17 NDAA and understanding the particular requirements for individual um, applications and, and understanding which uh, technologies are, are best uh, for, for individual um, applications. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so I wanted to uh, shift uh, just with the, the last uh, uh, couple of slides to uh, discussing uh, the executive order on uh, strengthening national resilience through responsible use of, of P&T services. Um, so this is executive order 13905 that uh, was signed by the president on February 12th of this year. Um, and uh, really uh, uh, foot stomps uh, the need for, for P&T uh, resiliency. So you, you'll see as, as stated uh, uh, that the purpose to uh, foster a responsible use of, of P&T services by critical infrastructure owners and operators um, and, and really ensure that uh, a disruption or manipulation of P&T services doesn't undermine uh, reliable or, or uh, the efficiency of, of critical infrastructure. So this is really important um, as we're looking to, to the future um, and just from a transportation standpoint, uh, very much embracing 
uh, automated, uh, you know, vehicles and reliable uh, positioning and navigation is it's at the, at the heart of that. Um, so we want to to make sure that we're fully aware of threats and, and vulnerabilities and and design those those systems uh, to to be resilient. Uh, so you see the the, the three uh, uh, main uh, uh, policy uh, goals that are identified there, and I think there's um, uh, you know very much uh, awareness uh, that. We need to engage with the critical infrastructure um, owners and, and, and operators uh, that this can't be done uh, only from the, the government uh, you know, standpoint that we don't uh, uh, own and, and operate the, the majority of the critical infrastructure. So it, it's, it's really uh, engaging uh, uh, through the, the sector specific uh, you know, agencies and creating awareness um, and, and working uh, to solutions for. for uh, resilient uh, PNT. Um, and in terms of uh, implementation, uh, there's uh, uh, nine points that were uh, laid out uh, in the, the executive order. Um, I won't uh, walk through all, all of them uh, in, in detail, um, but um, as I mentioned, uh, really working with the sector uh, specific uh, agency to develop something that's uh, called PNT profiles, um, so leveraging. Uh, the work uh, that uh, NIST performed as part of the cybersecurity uh, framework uh, and, the, and the cybersecurity profiles that were developed as part of that effort uh, into something uh, called PNT profiles, and I think you'll be hearing um, a lot of a lot more about that um, in the in the coming uh, months. Um, and uh, really leveraging those uh, PNT profiles and, and publishing them and what's identified in the executive orders, publishing those um, in the, the federal uh, radio navigation plan. And uh, a key component is is testing. So uh, just making sure that uh, we have uh, good uh, uh, test platforms and programs to ensure a PNT resiliency and uh, uh, building that uh, into uh, contract language uh, through uh, the uh, FR, FAR codes. Um, and uh, also, uh, I think one uh, aspect that we're, you know, very much looking forward to is having a national uh, R&D plan for, for PNT. So the Office of Science and Technology Policy is uh, responsible for, for leading uh, that, that effort. And again, uh, Expect to hear uh, more about that uh, in the in the coming months as, as uh, uh, there's uh, engagement uh, with uh, the, the the public on on seeking uh, input uh, to that um, R and D plan. And um, uh, finally, uh, Department of Commerce, in particular uh, NIST, will uh, provide a GNSS independent source of of, of UTC that's accessible uh, to the public and in, in, in private sector. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the uh, executive order um, for um, all, all of those uh, actions that uh, I had identified on, on the, the previous slide um, ha has some, some uh, deadlines in, in order to, uh, to really start to, to move forward in executing uh, the executive order. Um, so you'll see that, uh, again, the, the provision for that uh, accessible uh, UTC is within uh, 180 days of the executive order being uh, signed. Um, also uh, for DHS, DOT, and Department of Energy uh, to uh, start engaging with the critical infrastructure sectors and conducting uh, pilot uh, programs, putting a plan together within 180 days of, uh, for that. Uh, the uh, FAR contractual language update uh, with the PNT profiles within 180 days, uh, the R&D plan within uh, one year, um, and and then looking to um, to update uh, that uh, the, the PNT profiles um, uh, biannually and uh, uh, having a test plan uh, that DHS and the SSAs will put together within a year. Um, and uh, a report back to uh, o OSTP on the, the adoption of the PNT profiles, and again incorporation of those PNT profiles um, into the FRP, which is 
it's published uh, every two years. Uh, next slide. So at this point, I'm happy to uh, answer any uh, questions and I'll turn it back over to you, Mark, and thank you again for the opportunity to uh, present this morning. Karen, thank you. Uh, that was a, a really uh, informative, I, I really appreciate the, the honor of having you here and giving us all this information about what's going on in the government. Um, we're, we're kind of out of time for questions. I will ask uh, one quick question, if you will. Uh, were any threat scenarios considered in the demos? Um, so not specific uh, threats. Um, so it, it was uh, really looking at uh, impeded environments um, in, in in terms of uh, you know mainly physically impeded environments where, where GPS doesn't work so well. Um, I think you you bring up a a, a good point um, in terms of of you know next steps as we're evaluating. Um, uh, complementary PNT technologies is, is really un understanding uh, the threats and vulnerabilities that other technologies are subject to. Um, you know, obviously there's been a lot of focus on on threats and vulnerabilities to to, to GPS, and I think really um, in, embracing the the conform uh, conformance framework that DHS is is, uh, is working on. Um, as we're looking to design end user equipment and test that equipment uh, um, against uh, threats and, and, and vulnerabilities to uh, to really ensure that we're um, achieving the end goal of resiliency. Thank you, Karen. Um, appreciate all of that. And if anybody in the audience has other questions, you can send them in, and the questions can still be answered after the webinar. Uh, via email. Um, I'd like to now pass it over to uh, Eko Gerstung from Meinberg, and thank you for the sponsorship of Meinberg, and it's over to you, Eko. Thanks, Mark, and uh, it's an honor. Uh, welcome, everyone, um, to my small little fast uh, sponsor presentation. Um, next slide, please. I will uh, talk a little bit about um, a few approaches that Meinberg is um, thinking of when it comes to GNSS resiliency and, and um, uh, basically protection against attacks. Um, a few words about Meinberg, if you don't know the company. We have been founded in 1979, so it's over 40 years uh, completely focusing on synchronization, time and frequency synchronization. We never changed our name. We never changed our logo during those 40 years. So it's a very traditional and stable uh, company, very engineer focused. Um, we consider ourselves NTP and PTP technology leaders and uh, just recently opened an office in the United States. Next slide, please. So Mindberg products are used to synchronize a lot of critical infrastructure on the whole planet. Uh, um, we have many of the top tier stock exchanges uh, as our customers. We synchronize over 80 different power grids, national power grids um, um, all over the world. Um, we recently added broadcasting live production um, to our list of industries we are, we are operating in and we are selling our products to. Uh, we have a lot of telecom networks that use our equipment to synchronize their mobile backhaul, for example, their mobile uh, networks, uh, and of course, defense and air traffic control or traffic in general is, is also a big topic uh, for us. Next slide, please. Um, we have three major uh, uh, platforms, product platforms. I uh, encourage everyone to visit our website, uh, mindbergglobal.com to uh, look at our offering. We have a lot of different products and um, I, will, I will not go through them here because um, we would like to talk about, um, let's say a topic, next slide please, um, that um, um, covers security resilience and specific, uh, especially GNSS issues. Um, we consider, or we have several different approaches for um, 
yeah, for, for tackling this topic. One is uh, we typically encourage our customers to maximize their holdover capabilities, the holdover capabilities of their products in order to be able to withstand uh, jamming. Um, we implement consistency and integrity checks in our GNSS receiver firmware. Um, and um, we obviously also recommend customers to use multiple sources uh, uh, first of all, of course, to have a fallback. Second, to be able to compare those sources and maybe detect some uh, uh, inconsistency uh, between two different or multiple different sources. And I will talk about this a little bit later. Um, we typically use PTP to connect multiple systems uh, uh, together because we can basically send time over those PTP networks um, with the same accuracy that we typically achieve with receiving GNSS from the satellites. And uh, one of the products we we basically developed or one of the solutions we developed in order to be able to uh, protect our customers against spoofing and jamming is uh, what we call the trusted reference source, which is basically using a very stable atomic clock uh, to um, make sure we detect, we spot uh, GNSS anomalies and can for example, choose to ignore GNSS for, for a while uh, to see if that is going away or, or remains. Next slide, please. So one example of how we, we uh, help our customers or work with our customers to de develop solutions to protect them is uh, um, illustrated here. Um, in this example, we worked with a customer who has a very large campus uh, that allows him to place three of our devices 10 kilometers apart connected only by single mode fiber uh, to a central spot uh, which is um, shown here as a dedicated PTP transparent clock that's a switch a PTP aware switch and both three devices can now uh, basically send time to each other um, and compare their three clocks in order to make sure that they spot if one of them is uh, go is, is basically exceeding um, an offset limit. Uh, next slide, please. So in this example, starting with a GNSS reception, all three of them have the same time. Next slide. And now one of them is uh, spoofed, so he has a different time. Next slide. And uh, the comparison on all three devices is, is running independent, and they basically find out that A, the, the most left, device is uh, is basically having wrong time or not the right time. The next slide, please. And that will allow um, um, the systems basically to decide that, okay, A is ignoring its GNSS uh, receiver and now switches to PTP fallback, uh, which is getting the time from the other two devices. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, so that, that's a, a very short example of, of how we deal with this, uh, um, um, implementing all those uh, tactics that I, I refer to. If you have any questions, if you want to learn more about our solutions, again, please visit our website or just reach out to us via email. Thank you. Back to you, Mark. Thank you very much, Eiko. It's very interesting to see all the different industries that are now using timing. I'd like to hand it over to Karen O'Donoghue, who's going to talk about the winding path to deployment of time security. Karen? Um, yes, so uh, next slide, please. Uh, the, uh, so basically, I'm looking at, I'm coming here today to talk about it from the perspective of the standardization community and the, the standards that have been created. Um, in particular, I, I am co-chairing the NTP working group in the IETF, and I work in the IEEE 1588 security subcommittee. Um, so uh, as we have discussed previously, security has historically not been a very high priority of the time synchronization community because time is not secure information uh, necessarily, but uh, if, next slide, please. Um, but this has changed and the, we see a lot of attacks that are occurring. Uh, we see increasing interconnection and decentralization. Uh, we also see an increased evidence of the impact of, in, of um, inadequate security. Next slide, please. Uh, we see an interdependence between security and time. Uh, we see that vulnerabilities are being discovered in our deployed systems. Uh, and we have uh, 
legal and compliance requirements. Next slide, please. Um, and we see that research is occurring. The, uh, and in particular, there's been a fair amount of research in recent years around both um, what causes uh, att various attack vectors for time synchronization protocols, along with potential solutions to improve. Uh, next slide, please. You can see the, the causes of security problems fall into three basic buckets. The first one being flaws in the, the configuration and implementation of the underlying protocol. Uh, the second one being weaknesses in the actual protocol itself. Uh, and then the third is the lack of adequate security mechanisms. Next slide, please. Uh, however, given all of this, we have not had any updated specifications for time synchronization security, network time synchronization security for over eight years until this year. And I'm very happy to, to see that this year we will publish uh, an update in both 1588 and also NTP uh, that will be uh, updates for security. Um, so next slide, please. I'm not going to cover this in a great deal of detail. Um, Doug Arnold, who's following me, will talk more about PTP and what PTP is doing. Uh, but if the PTP approach to the problem was to, uh, for the, um, so for flaws in the um, configuration and implementation of the protocol and weaknesses in the actual protocol itself, you have prongs C and D, which basically provide some architectural guidance and some monitoring and management guidance. For the lack of adequate security mechanisms, uh, prong B looked at the specification of some external transport security mechanisms. And then the biggest addition to 1588 uh, was the uh, creation of the authentication TLV. And that's what Doug will talk about more. Next slide, please. Um, so this is the new T authentication TLV that is part of the IEEE 1588 specification that will be published uh, sometime this year. Uh, next slide, please. So looking specifically more on the IETF side of the house, if you look at those three buckets, um, flaws in the configuration and implementation of the protocol, uh, the IETF published the NTP best current practice document last year, which collects together a number of, um, of uh, known things to help people properly configure their systems in particular to address uh, distributed denial of service attacks, among other things. For weaknesses in the protocol itself, uh, the IETF published um, an updated MAC for NTP. Uh, this basically replaces the MD5 crypto algorithm with an AESC MAC, uh, which is specified in RFC 4493. Um, this was the first time that the NTP protocol has had any sort of uh, algorithm agility. Um, the NTP working group is also looking at things like client data minimization. And then the third thing, which is the primary point of this presentation is the lack of adequate security mechanisms. And so uh, the IETF has been working for quite a long time on the network time security specification. Next slide, please. Um, in fact, some of the original work in the IETF actually dates back um, to 2012, over eight years ago. Uh, and then starting in 2015 has been the evolution of this document. Uh, this was approved by the IESG. Uh, which is the uh, controlling body of the IETF in March of this year and is in the final publication phases. Uh, so um, shortly we should see this actually published as an RFC. Um, so now that we have this updated standard um, and this particular document addresses the use of NTS with the network time protocol NTP um, and the 1588 working group is now looking at how to apply uh, NTS to PTP as well. So I'm just going to cover a few quick things about what NTS does. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so NTS basically divides the problem into two pieces. One is using the transport layer security protocol, TLS. And this is a very common protocol in use in a number of um, uh, internet standards. It's in fact what is used to secure your web traffic. Um, and in that phase, we use TLS uh, and we establish the keys. And then in phase two, the keys that are established are used as cookies in the context of, uh, of securing NTP. So, um, in, uh, so the, the pieces of it are pulled apart. It's a little bit clearer um, in the second diagram. Next, next slide, please. So here you can see that the, the key exchange traffic uh, between the client and the server 
is separate from the NTP traffic. And then you're using extension fields within NTP to carry the, the keys that are properly needed. Um, in this particular case, the, uh, the server is separate from the, the, the key exchange server is separate from the time server. Um, they could be implemented together or they could be implemented separate. And I just chose to put this, the, uh, the single drawing in. Um, so in the key exchange phase, next slide, please. Um, basically what you're doing here is negotiating what protocols you support. NTS was envisioned originally to support both NTP and, and PTP. The current document only addresses NTP, but uh, I think it can be extended. Um, you also negotiate what uh, algorithms you're using, what server you want to talk to, and what the port of that server is. Uh, currently, uh, we're using UDP port 123. However, there is some conversations about moving uh, secured NTP traffic off of port 123 for a number of reasons. Um, so there's a basic key exchange phase, and then using those key exchanges, you go to the next slide, please. Um, you uh, secure your NTP packets with this. And so this is just a really high level view of, of how this uh, is structured. NTP has the concept of extension fields, and using those extension fields, you can um, incorporate the NTS, the network time security. Uh, cookies and basically this is providing you authentication of your servers and an integrity checking for the packet itself. Uh, so this is a new mechanism for NTP uh, and uh, next slide please. Uh, over the course of the last year we have done um, a number of tests. Uh, we're at the stage where we have prototype implementations uh, but no, um, no production quality code out there yet. Um, and these are a number of the prototype implementations that we have, and we have a number of clients and a number of servers in the open source community. Um, so we've done some basic interoperability testing. Um, there's obviously a long way to go beyond that. Next slide, please. So how do we get from here to actual deployment? Um, we've done the, the, the initial standards development. We've done our preliminary implementations and interoperability testing, and we're at the point now where we're looking for some, we're, we're at the point of, uh, production quality implementations and commercial products, and also some tools for testing and troubleshooting. Um, and hopefully we can move this arrow on down through there. Next slide, please. Um, so we're working on a project to uh, see if we can move this implementations along. I think this year we will be looking at, there's been some changes to the plans based on uh, obviously the, the current situation in the world, but uh, we are planning a number of test, vet, test events this year. Uh, these test events will focus on continued interoperability testing, but also the development of tools um, and, and testing uh, to measure the, the uh, both the, uh, for troubleshooting of the, of the protocol itself, along with the actual performance impacts of the protocol. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so basically, N the NTS for NTP specification is finished. It's in the final editing steps, but all of the technical changes are done. Uh, discussions are underway in the IEEE 1588 on how to specify NTS for PTP, and you're going to hear a little bit more about that in the next presentation. Um, protocol and uh, prototype implementations and testing, have, some has already been conducted. There's more underway, um, and it, it's really time to look at uh, moving to the next step of building solutions and testing deployments, gathering the lessons learned from that and documenting it so that we can uh, provide good guidance moving forward. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and then the last slide, this is just a list of resources that I thought might be, uh, might be useful. Um, and I also wanted to, uh, before I end, to acknowledge the hard work of, of both, committee, both committees that worked on these standards. It was, I think, a, a, a long, Paul, but we're at a point now where uh, we have something that I think we've got good consensus in the community around, and it, it's time to learn more about how it's actually going to work in our systems. With that, I end. Thank you very much, Karen. That was that was very uh, clear and uh, covered all the topics, and yet managed to bring us back on time. I appreciate all of that, and. Uh, yeah, if, if uh, anybody has specific questions for Karen or wants to work with this 
the whole overview of the system, both for PTP and NTP that's going on. She has her email address there. I'd like to now introduce Doug Arnold, who's going to focus in on key management in PTP. Go ahead, Doug. Thanks, Mark. Before I get started, I want to just real quick thank Mark and the organizing committee and all the competent people at ADIS for throwing this together on sh short notice and converting a conference into a series of webinars that have at least for me, been extremely interesting. So thanks for that. Uh, okay, so in in the next slide, I'm going to just uh, give a brief uh, next slide, please. Uh, a brief agenda. Talk about some terminology. The key bits of that terminology you heard uh, in Karen's talk that we just uh, went through. The PTP authentication TLV, network time security, uh, TLS key exchange, um, and all of these things are combined together in a proposed scheme uh, I'm presenting for how to uh, secure at least one type of PTP. Next slide, please. Um, so I've had a number of conversations with network operators about network timing security, and they kind of all fell into one of two categories. And I, when I wrote these down, I realized, oh, these are the first two stages of grieving. So in this case, I assume they're grieving about the lack of network timing security. Um, you know, the first, you know, one group of people will respond with, oh, I, I don't need any kind of network time security. Our network is very secure. Um, uh, I seem to remember reading a lot of things in the business news about networks that were very secure that got hacked. So I hope that doesn't happen to them. But I suspect that you know probably the timing people and security people are very compartmentalized in large organizations, and that's part of uh, where that's coming from. the The other response is is anger. I've had people say, um, you know, why why does uh, why isn't there an updated NTP? Well, there's going to be very shortly. Uh, Karen O'Donoghue who just uh, presented that. And why does PTP only have this experimental annex that nobody ever implemented? Um, and that last sentence there um, is a more polite version of what someone actually said to me. Uh, okay, so in our next slide, uh, I'm going to talk about you know a little more about these three key uh, technologies. First is transport layer security, which is the basis of NTS. It's a cryptographic network security protocol, uh, fairly complicated, very robust, tried and true. It's used in all kinds of things: web browsing, email, messaging, voice over IP. You all use it every day, and you're using it right now. Um, so that's uh, that's encouraging in terms of using something that's known to work well. Um, then we have the network time security Karen talked about that's uh, almost ready for publication out of the IETF and it basically adapts uh, TLS uh, for use in specifically unicast uh, client server mode uh, NTP which is what you know 90 plus percent of uh, all NTP implementations are doing. Um, and, you know, I would say that, you know, people who build NTP servers are going to implement this. And then there's the authentication TLV. This is uh, coming out in the, um, the new version of IEEE 1588, which is also in the last stages before publication that should come out very soon, um, has defined, and that's basically a, a TLV style PTP message extension that can be used uh, to ensure the integrity of a message that it didn't get altered along the way. Um, it does require a yet unspecified key management system uh, to distribute and refresh keys. Um, there's a little bit of information on that uh, in the informative annex that Karen alluded to, but it really needs a little bit more uh, discussion. Um, and 
I'm going to suggest that NTS key management could be adapted for at least unicast PTP. So in the next slide, uh, here's this picture again. You saw it uh, just a few minutes ago. Um, kind of the this is the uh, authentication TLV that's in PTP, and you know key aspects of it are there's a security parameter pointer that basically is a index into a table. Um, and the purpose of the table is if a PTP node is talking to multiple PTP nodes, it might need different security um, parameters for each of those conversations. And so it needs a table to keep track of those. And when a message comes in, it says, um, I'm using these parameters. Um, the next uh, security parameter indicator, that's just a flag field saying whether you have any of the optional fields, the ones in the dashed lines there. <coughs> And for our discussion, we're not using any of those. So uh, we don't need that. The key ID uh, is very important uh, in how NTS works, um, where keys are pointed to by an ID. And then at the very end, there's the ICV, the integrity check value, which is, you know, used to be called hash code, you know, basically the thing you compute when you receive this message and prove that it hasn't been altered not just this message, but the whole PTP message. Okay, so in the next slide, uh, we'll actually we'll skip this, we went through that. So we'll go to the next one. Um, properties of NTS, uh, okay, as, as Karen pointed out, it starts with a, like a TLS style, uh, you know, a key establishment server that uses you know, TLS technology. And this is needed to start you get your initial cookies. Um, and then the client and server can continue without the uh, key establishment server and until some time when they need to, to go back and, and start again. Um, and maybe that can happen a few times if they get, as Karen suggested, a, a list of cookies to start. And then it can be a while before they would have to go back and uh, the server again. Uh, then there's NTS. So uh, key properties, NTP servers, are stateless. That's um, they don't save data about any specific client, and that's very important because NTP servers can have enormous numbers of clients. You know, it can be millions if it's a public NTP server. Um, so they don't want to. They they're okay with saving a table of keys with uh, key key IDs, but they don't want to remember anything about a specific client. Um, so this. Um, works, uh, you know, the NTS works for, as I said, unicast client server mode NTP, which is nearly every NTP um, operation that's going on out there in the world, um, and includes uh, hash code and includes encryption to hide keys as they get transferred, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. So how would this work for PTP? Well, I think it would work well for a profile which was based on unicast with negotiation, because that makes PTP not only unicast, but more of a client server paradigm. And for IPv4, IPv6 mapping, which uh, you know, TLS and NTS are all um, developed in with layer three in mind. So in the next slide, uh, I show these kind of, here's the, the key players, uh, this is similar to a diagram you saw a few minutes ago. Um, you know, there's a PTP slave port and PTP master port, and they start off by both talking to a, a key establishment server. So it starts with the slave, says, I want, I want to talk to a PTP master. Um, these are all the algorithms I could, uh, I could support. Um, and then the key exchange server goes to the master port um, and you know, mit mitigates the algorithm parameter negotiation and, and sends the first uh, you know, batch of cookies off. Okay, so in the next slide, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more. What are these cookies? Uh, my apologize. My apology to uh, Keishan, which tells me he really likes oatmeal, and I've only got chocolate chip here. But um, the the kinds of cookies we're really talking about these are messages that go 
uh, among these devices that I just indicated. Um, and we've got like a slave to master cookie, which has the um, ID of the of the current key uh, that's to be used. Um, maybe there's different keys for slave to master and master to slave. I think that's a, that, that could go either way. And and a reminder of the negotiated algorithm and parameters. Um, and this is uh, uh, necessary um, to to be as much like uh, NTP as possible to make it easy for people implementing time servers that are going to do both um, to remind remind the master about this particular slave is talking to us so it doesn't have to remember even though it's traditional in PTP to remember um, then there's the master to slave cookie it includes the both the IDs and the keys uh, along with the negotiated algorithm um, and this is sent encrypted because it has the key in it um, and that way it sends the uh, slave the next cookie to use um, which it, the slave will send to remind the, uh, the master. So the cookie scheme allows the NTP servers not to keep state for each client um, as, as I mentioned and for PTP your master ports do keep data on slaves but we retain the scheme specifically so that people can build time servers that implement both NTP and PTP uh, with the same key exchange mechanism and that's that's actually something I've heard uh, from people in the field is like please don't come up with another key exchange mechanism I've already got software running in my network can't you just use one of those it's like um, I think we can okay so in the next slide I show a little bit more on the uh, how these messages are flowing uh, the request comes to the KE server from the slave port and in this case you know, something that would be different from what Karen described for NTP because it's very much in a tradition of PTP unicast PTP for the slave to have its own list of masters that it wants to talk to and so I would suggest it sends to the KE server this is the master I want to talk to uh, rather than the server KE server finding a, an appropriate master um, uh, the algorithms and parameters are selected by the master. Uh, it looks through the, the supported ones and says, oh, I like this one. Um, sends back the parameters and then the KE server you know, creates the first cookie or, or maybe a batch of cookies, um, which basically includes uh, the algorithms and keys uh, going to both devices. Okay, so in the next the next slide uh, I show what now happens between the slave port and master port after this has taken place. Um, so uh, on the left we see this is basically how traditional unicast PTP works such as in the ITU profiles um, where a slave port requests a, a series of announced messages and the request a series of sync messages and and delay responses um, for some period of time uh, to get a contract to get those messages for some period of time the master port says yes I can give those and then start sending the messages um, and the messages can all be at different rates you know, the, the the time duration and the message rates that I show are are typical of used in the telecom profile um, PTP and if you look on the right, okay, how do we how do we augment that for this key exchange? And so what I'm proposing is uh, you know to kind of minimize the number of uh, key exchange messages. I'm going to just do this in the announce message. Um, the slave port would send the current cookie. This is the one we're going to be using for this contract, um, and the master port replies with. Uh, when it acknowledges that says oh, by the way here's the next one um, and then all the other messages during that contract period just use the authentication TLD um, okay so that's the basic idea if you look on the next slide um, 
I have a summary here. So NTS for NTP, it's a new security option to replace auto key. Um, it covers unicast client server, NTP only. Uh, and it's pretty much certain to be implemented in commercial time servers. I think if you don't implement this, um, you won't be in that business much longer. It's uh, really gonna be a requirement. Um, and it's based on TLD, TLS, the transport layer security, you know, key exchange. Um, uh, but it doesn't require you to be constantly talking to the TLS uh, key exchange server. Um, you can you can generate keys from the NTP server or PTP grandmaster. So we would adapt this to PTP, at least a profile that would be based on layer three unicast. Um, and there are you know, a couple of these profiles defined by the ITU, for example. Um, there could be other ones defined. Um, the cookies are exchanged during the announced message negotiation. Um, a variant on that could be having a different set of cookies for sync messages and delay response requests. Um, that, that's also possible. Um, and then the keys are used in the authentication TLD. So that's, that's my talk in the next slide. I just wanna say, um, so thank you. And if there's questions you have that we don't have time to get to today, you know, feel free to send me an email. I'm happy to uh, um, entertain your questions and try to give a good answer to them. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Great talk. Uh, we've we've covered now uh, timing integrity in. Uh, NTP and PTP networks. We're about to transition into some GNSS integrity issues. Uh, I think Josh Clanton is going to begin. Uh, over to you, Josh. Thanks, Mark. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, just want to thank uh, Addis uh, for the opportunity to brief here. Um, uh, myself, I'm Josh Clanton, and uh, my colleague David Hodo. Uh, with IS4S, uh, had a heavy hand in this work as well. And today we're going to talk about a uh, multi level approach uh, for integrating uh, GNSS integrity into timing applications. Uh, next slide. So, uh, this slide isn't particularly going to give a lot of you any new information, but uh, we do want to give credence to the motivation behind uh, the work that we are doing. Um, as, as we all know, critical, critical infrastructure is, uh, is heavily reliant on timing from GPS in many cases, and uh, the spoofing threat is real. It's no longer just a lab experiment. There are many uh, documented incidents in the open literature. There are uh, even uh, tutorials on, on YouTube on how to do these things, and there's textbooks talking about uh, different attack methods, and, and the, the, threat is, the threat is real and out there. And, and we as a community, uh, through a lot of the talks you've heard today, are trying to uh, develop methods to be resilient to these threats. Um, so this particular work that we're talking about today, uh, IS4S, uh, we've partnered with Auburn University through an effort with uh, DHS Science and Technology uh, to put together a, an open architecture uh, toolkit uh, that industry can use uh, to help develop, develop uh, resilient timing systems. Um, so next slide. Um, this effort is part of a larger uh, thing going on with DHS that some of you, or a lot of you actually may be familiar with, uh, the Resilient PNT Conformance Framework. Uh, the primary goal of this is to provide guidelines uh, for industry uh, and manufacturers to create and evaluate timing sources. Um, the key emphasis is obviously on critical infrastructure applications, but it's applicable to um, any timing sources that are tied to GPS or other satellite navigation systems. And some of the key concepts within this framework um, are to provide guiding principles uh, for system design, um, and then def define different resilience levels to, that will quantify performance of these resilient BNT systems. And at, at a high level, it calls for a uh, kind of a three core function approach. Uh, and you can see that on the right, there's a prevent, respond, and recover. And Regardless of uh, the core functions that uh, we're talking about, uh, detecting the threats is needed across all of them. Um, 
GPS anomalies are sometimes hard to detect, sometimes not, depending on the type of attack. Uh, and the, and the uh, framework aims to uh, create systems that can be able to expand as threats and detection techniques evolve. Okay, next slide. So the primary goal of this project was to develop a set of uh, a library, basically, that uh, contained a set of detection methods um, as a uh, you know, a usable software tool uh, to use in critical timing applications. And the, the idea is to for this to help manufacturers and end users um, deploy these resilient timing systems uh, more effectively and um, and educate the community on, on the, uh, the types of things that can be done uh, in software to, um, to help detect these threats. And we want to kind of be real uh, clear that what we're providing is we're not trying to provide a turnkey solution or product that competes with the industry offerings. We're providing a an open source reference tool that aligns with DHS's uh, efforts that they're doing and uh, basically as a community education type of thing. Um, this work uh, is going to provide uh, basically two resources to the community. Uh, the first is what I've already mentioned, a, um, an architecture that uh, provides uh, data model definitions um, a set of configurable integrity checks that are uh, out of the box that come with the library, and then a framework that allows uh, end users to take that library and then add their own flavor, their own additional checks into the library. And it's a cross-platform C++ implementation that can be used on any uh, many types of platforms. Um, the second part of this is a, a demonstration kit that basically provides a hardware design and a list of um, uh, COTS components that you could purchase and then assemble and then load the software on there um, with a user interface as a demonstration kit. The figure on the right is, uh, I'm not going to get too down in the weeds on it, but it basically tries to convey the idea of how everything is uh, put together in a, in a uh, open architecture where there is a set of register assurance checks that come with the library. Uh, end users can use the API to write their own. There's a data model and an internal repository. Uh, all meant to output an assurance level at the end that can be used to determine, um, you know, any type of decision down the line, whether it be switched to a holdover or uh, do other types, some other type of processing. Okay, next slide. So, again, I'm, I'm talking about this open architecture approach. Um, what, what is included is uh, the first thing is a data model that describes the uh, receiver observables, uh, which would be the inputs to the to the architecture and then um, also included with this would be this set of assurance checks for processing and then there's an assurance level that is the, the output and what we've tried to put together here is a multi-layered approach that allows uh, integration of it into any level in the, in the processing chain so the figure at the bottom shows the chain on the right that comes in from the antenna to our front end signal processing and then down to the solution processor. And what these checks are designed to do is take observables and data from all, all of those stages and form the appropriate check on each of them. So the uh, the blue box there is, is uh, um, the out of the box library and there's three separate classes of checks in there. Uh, there's multi antenna checks and you can see there's a, a little dotted line there that indicates if you've got a secondary antenna and receiver, uh, you can use that in the chain as well to help you uh, run some different checks. There are signal process, I'm sorry, signal power and uh, multi-peak detection algorithms, a set of those, and then there's uh, model-based consistency checks. And so the idea is you could have any one or all of these checks configured that are registered inside an uh, integrity monitor application, and then each one of those outputs an assurance level that is then blended together to output this total assurance level. And we've also indicated on the chart here there is a um, out on the right that you can also implement and integrate a user-defined check into this as well. Uh, next slide. Okay, so we can talk a little bit about how we're the approach to blend uh, each of these assurance levels together for one output. So the, each registered check will take in some type of observable or combination of observables and output uh, an assurance level that's just for that uh, particular algorithm. Um, then you would assign a weight to each check uh, that would be um, effectively assigned by whatever uh, system integrator is using the software or manufacturer, whoever's configuring the software would set that weight uh, and it would be user platform specific. Um, ideally, it would be based on PD or PFA, but that might change depending on the type of 
uh, knowledge of the system and how it performs against certain threats. So uh, ultimately that would be desirable, but um, it can be configured however the end user desires. And then there is a, um, the weighted values are put together and thresholded to produce uh, one of four primary assurance levels. Uh, and they're listed at the bottom. Um, so the first level would be unavailable, which means that, um, and again, this, these levels can be unique to each check or, or this is the same table use for the master level as well. So unavailable zero means uh, there's insufficient data or not yet been processed. Um, unassured, which would be a value of one, uh, indicates that there's a very high likelihood that the measurement source cannot be trusted. So something is um, either an attack is happening or the uh, data output is not looking right. Or for whatever reason, it is an indication of not to trust uh, the time source that is um, coming from GPS. Um, the inconsistent level, uh, which is two, um, there is kind of an intermediate step there, which means that uh, there's a, we, we can't reliably determine that the measurement is valid, um, but we can't indicate there's a high likelihood that it's not either. So it's an intermediate step there. And then assured is, uh, indicates a um, high likelihood that the measurement can be trusted. Uh, next slide. Okay, so I mentioned earlier a uh, demonstration kit um, for this. And what we've done is try to put together a platform that we can take to uh, that we use in the lab and both that we take to test events uh, to demonstrate the lab, demonstrate the software. And we've uh, put together a system of cost receivers and hardware to do that. Um, the uh, diagram on the bottom there shows a, uh, there's, there's two, again, there's two receivers in this to in indicate or to take advantage of the multi uh, receiver algorithm. So there's a primary antenna that feeds the, um, the primary receiver and then a software defined radio to give uh, IF, IF data samples uh, to the processing host. And this is to run those deeper level checks. Um, so to get down into the uh, multi peak and signal processing type checks. And then there, the second antenna there is uh, intended to run those multi antenna checks. And this, the processing host will uh, contains an integrity API test application that puts all those things together and it provides a uh, assurance output to, to analyze. And the, um, the pictures on the right kind of show some of the COTS hardware that we put together. I'm not gonna go through all that right now, but if there's any questions about what the current design contains, I'd be happy to fill those later. Uh, next slide. Uh, also, as part of this uh, user interface, uh, I'm sorry, as part of this work, we have developed a, a demo application in the user interface. Um, the idea is for the user interface to demonstrate the library and the processing chain integration. Um, and the pics there at the bottom show uh, some of the uh, front, front panel views of this, uh, of this user, user interface. Uh, there's a map plot to show the, uh, show the positions and the, some of the observables. And there's also a breakout screen that can show you the integrity level of both the, uh, the full blended level and then also the uh, levels of each check and some of the diagnostic data that goes along with each of those as well. And uh, checks can be added or, added or removed to demonstrate the effectiveness so as you go through. If you're simulating this in the lab and you want to see how the algorithm performs with or without a check, you can adjust the weight of that uh, in, in, on the fly and see what that does to your, to your integration. Um, it's just a way of uh, demonstrating that processing chain and what, how deeper into the processing chain you can go to uh, get better effectiveness on your uh, integrity check. Okay, uh, next slide. So as a community, we're, we're uh, providing multiple integration options for this. Um, end user system integrators, manufacturers can all take advantage of this. Um, the integrity library itself uh, could be embedded in, in receivers or timing devices. And again, the, um, the integrator will be responsible for reading those observables and then converting them to the data model. Um, the library would provide uh, the assurance level to uh, operate through the event alerting, um, alerting the user uh, of any type of uh, anomaly going on. Um, the, the development kit itself could be used as a standalone device, uh, you know, as a, as a comparison to um, you know, to your own piece of equipment, or if it's something you want to use to educate in the lab and test with, uh, the, the possibilities are, are uh, numerous on that one. So what we're trying to provide is just a tool for the community to use uh, to do those types of things to help develop those resilient uh, timing systems. Okay, next slide. And I think 
I have a couple of backup slides, but I won't get to those. Uh, we can go ahead and end it here, Mark, if uh, we're good on good on time. Thank you very much, Josh. Um, this has been a very interesting talk. Uh, I look forward to learning more about it and the work you're doing. I'd now like to introduce our next speaker, Andreas Bausch, uh, talking about uh, some timing services based on European GNSS technologies. Andreas? Yeah. Thank you, Mark, for the kind introduction. Thank you also for inviting me to be part of this event. Next slide, please. After a brief introduction, next slide, please. After a brief introduction, I will uh, motivate why I submitted this type of slides and this type of work. I will refer to European GNSS and in particular make mention on one project, which is called EGALITE, which was funded by the European Union. And then I, come, um, I will conclude. Next slide. Um, Mark, already in the very introduction of the, of the session today, mentioned that PTB is the National Metrology Institute of Germany. We exist since 8087, have our headquarters in Braunschweig, and are, of course, not as big as NIST in Boulder and in Gaithersburg, but we are still a prominent metrology institute. Timing activities concentrate on development and operation of atomic clocks. We have a legal mandate to disseminate, realize and disseminate legal time for our country which is a very helpful situation. And we are engaged in a lot of international projects. Next, next slide, please. Um, my motivation. Um, many applications, and I de facto need not tell this to the, most of the audience, many applications require assured access to accurate time. Time could be the time unit, frequency, the one PPS epoch, or indeed the time of day. And it is required for making measurements or for date and time stamping traceable to international and or legal standards. So providing access to standards, this is the mission of the Metrology Institutes, and this is what I have been working for many years. GNSS reception is predominant in many fields, but let me ask, is it assured? Is it accurate? And is it sufficient to obtain traceability? Next slide. So <clears throat> uh, is it assured? This was just the subject of the last talk. It's not my topic. And we know that measures that, of course, it can be uh, jammed and spoofed. But I will not go in any detail. Next slide. Uh, is it accurate? It's actually GNSS reception revolutionized timekeeping decades ago. Still. I would say it is technically better than many user requirements. Let's see the next talk, but I think the statement is still correct. Next slide. It's okay. Next slide. By the way, Mark Weiss, our chairman, and David Allen published the first paper on GPS common view in 1980. So it's really a nice occasion today. Uh, traceability. This is where the rules of metrology come into play, and I will and light time in the next slide, which will take a little more, little more time. Next slide, please. Traceability is relevant for both making measurements and for time and date stamping, and it is defined in the Vocabulaire International de Metrologie, the international vocabulary of metrology, as the property of a measurement result, whereby the result can be related to a reference through a documented unbroken chain of calibrations. In parentheses, I would prefer the word comparisons each contributing to the measurement uncertainty. Each of the highlighted words would deserve a detailed discussion, but this is impossible within 15 minutes. So in short, the metrological community feels confident that reception and processing of GNSS signals alone does not provide traceability as defined above. And I give two references. One is from the US. Matsakis used to work for USNO in Washington, and Pister is a colleague of mine. Next slide. Just to remind you, whenever yeah, there is such a little blue star, there will be a reference on my last slide, which I will not show during the presentation today. Next slide. So now we come to the European GNSS, and I can concentrate de facto on Galileo. You see on the right the orbital planes. You see the orbital planes populated with green dots, which means that the satellites are up and functioning and transmitting signals. So the constellation is essentially complete. Initial services have been officially announced by the European uh, 
Commission in December 2016. The minimum performance level in, during these days is uh, specified in the open service service definition document. <clears throat> and okay, given the situation, the European Union and the, its agency GSA are interested in the optimal exploitation of the Galileo services for European users and of course on a global scale. Next scale, yeah, next slide. So the, this is so <clears throat> European Union and GSA sponsor a couple of projects actually in this direction. Uh, the one which I'm going to present now is was called EGALITE. It was funded by the European Commission under the H2020 framework program, and it studied the feasibility of a dedicated timing service or the dedicated timing services based on Galileo. Next, and the partners were uh, we were organized by the Spanish company GMV as the industrial prime. Um, PTB was part and the Observatorio Algeal de Belgique in Brussels. And VVA was the partner which was involved in commercial affairs, cost-benefit cost analysis and things like that. They were the experts in this. Next slide. So we come up with two proposals at the end. One is a service to obtain legal traceability. It is resembles a little bit that what has been established by NIST here in the States for all types of customers. It's a link between the user and the National Timing Laboratory uh, by exchanging of data, which are to be processed in a central server. And the central server would, ex would accept all kinds of data from the user, from binary to Rhinex to, to, to standard timing formats. Uh, of course, not all user equipment on the market is gives the user access to the binaries. So this is something which has then to be established or to be yeah, established. Um, the timing service would be uh, working for GPS and Galileo users, users also with low cost timing receivers and for dual and single frequency equipment. Um, at the moment, there is not a decision made uh, whether the, such a service is going to be implemented in Europe. Next slide. Another service was <clears throat> A proposed that is built on this is based on timing integrity monitoring stations. Uh, um, there would be deployed and set of stations all over the globe, and the central processing facility would generate timing flags that would be sent to uh, through the Galileo signal in space or through the Galileo navigation message. Uh, in the sense, used do not use Galileo for timing applications. This time service would provide end-to-end -end commitment performances to the users. <clears throat> of course, it requires the timing receivers to be developed according to dedicated standards. And VVA, also the, the, our EGALITE team, decided that based on a cost-benefit analysis, such a service would really be worse to be considered seriously and to be implemented. Next slide. Other results of this project are maybe a little bit more anecdotic. Uh, we made, a, had, we, were, we made a questionnaire to all the AU members about their use of GNSS and their rules regarding legal time. In all European Union, de facto, we have four time zones between UTC and UTC plus three hours. So when I'm standing here, it's UTC plus two, so I'm ready for leaving home. Um, in some countries, we have, many countries have a time law. In some countries, legal time is defined, but no institute is given the task to realize it. Others have the situation that there's no legal mandate to disseminate it. On the other side, all European institutes practically disseminate time of day information via the public internet using the protocol NTP, which we <clears throat> well, all of you know. And the laws are not very specific. They don't mention GNSS, which can be seen as a chance to use them anyway. And not everything has to be fixed in the law to be useful. Next slide. So this is the situation de facto which exists. Reception of GPS is used in countless applications for access to legal time, whatever the law says. And Galileo is of course known, but it is not yet widely used. The number of receivers is still limited, which are, have been deployed. The European, Europeans also have an overlay service, um, European geostationary overlay service, like the was in the United States but this is of minor relevance in the time frequency community. Next slide. I come to, <clears throat> there's one issue which I would not like, as it's my a very personal slide because I 
think this is something European use of European GNSS can be improved very simple uh, in a simple way because at the moment the documentation provided is to my opinion not sufficient and we have made proposals to improve the documentation and I got feedback from the Commission that they take this up are going to take this up in the future so that um, this will facilitate the use of European GNSS in all kinds of applications that I mentioned before. Next slide. The, uh, but the, the, this is just one slide which I was tempted to show. Using Galileo is really an advantage. You see on the left, you to see two, um, one day of data collecting GPS observations on the left and Galileo observations on the right. You see uh, the same receiver, the same antenna, the same time reference. You see the dispersion of data uh, in GPS is much bigger than, or is substantially bigger than for Galileo. That means clock and orbit prediction in Galileo is very well made. And for single frequency users, there is this Nequick ionosphere prediction model, which is gives much better results than the Globusha, which is used in GPS. Next slide. Um, and this is my, now I come to the conclusions. They are also very personal. I would say in all, we often use the word synchronization, but we, I really encourage you to make a clear distinction between time interval, mutual synchronization within a network, synchronization with respect to UTC, time of day according to legal time. Four bullets, all are valid, all are relevant, but they really need different techniques. One should also always clearly differentiate between legal prescription, for example, the German Telekommunikationsgesetz prescribes the use of legal time in tele for telecom operators. Prescriptions due to regulations like the EU, EU regulations for the financial sector and purely technical requirements which may happen in, or which may exist in critical infrastructure applications. Next slide. Um, there are ways to make measurements result traceable in the sense of the WIM recommend to, to retrieve and analyze GNSS signal monitoring results from NMEs or other resources. I give one example in the reference. And recommendation to get signal delays in the receiver calibrated whenever epoch accurate time synchronization matters. Do not simply trust in the specifications of the manufacturer who often gives only the noise and not the offset from UTC. Next slide. And now the final recommendations, and this is, comes is very nice because we had the same on the table minutes ago. No single source of timing should be recommended for using critical infrastructures. Promote the use of redundant timing information uh, via <clears throat> diverse routes in exacting timing systems. And some of you on the in the on the screens, you will probably remember this uh, this cartoon or this, this this graph, which was which I stole from a presentation from this from Stefania Römisch last year or so. So this is the end. Next slide. This is the farewell slide. I would say yes. Thank you for the opportunity to share my ideas with you. Uh, feel free to contact me. This is my email and you, we have a website www.pdv.de slash time. So thank you. Mark, it's your turn again. Thank you very much, Andreas, for an excellent presentation. Uh, really important things about keeping track of what you mean by time or timing or traceability. Uh, I'd like to introduce the next speaker, uh, Akis Troninos from Aspiring Communications. Uh, another critical factor in using timing receivers for, from GNSS on multipath. Go ahead, Akis. Mm -hmm. Uh, hello, hello from me. Good afternoon from the UK. Thank you for hosting me today. Uh, my name is Akis, uh, work for Spirant, and today we I will be presenting you some results we got that show the effect of multipath on timing receivers. Before we start, I'd like to apologize because in our abstract we we stated that we would have live measurements as well, but because of this whole situation with the virus. We weren't able to get any measurements from live sky uh, tests. So I will be presenting the simulation results we got. So the objective objectives of this session will be for me to talk you through our setup that we used, present your results that show 
the effect that multiple has on timing receivers when they're placed in dense urban environments and discussing about the importance of introducing testing methods to measure such effects. Uh, next slide, please. So sometimes our PRTCs have to be installed in places where there is no open, open uh, a clear view of the sky. For example, in uh, in a city centre, for example. So multipath will degrade the performance of the timing accuracy, and therefore it's important to be able to to know beforehand where we can install a, an antenna so that we can have an accurate timing. Uh, next slide, please. So on the left here, we can see how multipath looks like. So if we were able to visualize it and see electromagnetic waves, we would see something like that. On the right, we see just a narrow roll in London which uh, of course will uh, introduce some kind of multipath, maybe not that severe, but multipath uh, will be there. Next slide, please. Uh, so geometry, so multipath depends solely on the environment uh, that is around the antenna. And that is why it is quite challenging to be modeled. There are of course a lot of uh, approaches online and uh, uh, there is a lot of documentation on how to mitigate multipath but it's quite challenging it's it's interference so it can be constructive or destructive depending on how the, the signals arrive at the antenna and in the case of constructive interference we have a, an increase in the current noise ratio while on a destructive interference, we have a decrease in the current noise ratio. And what's also important and interesting is that multipath affects frequencies differently. In our tests, we considered uh, GPSL1 and GLONSL1 frequencies due to the limitations we had on, on the PRTC that we used. Uh, next slide, please. So our setup was based on uh, figures I.7 and I.8 of Appendix I in the G.8072 recommendation. There is a link in the last slide where you can access and, and read through that documentation. However, those setups didn't take into account non-ideal GNSS conditions, such as multipath, for example. So we, we introduced a 3D ray tracing software in order to have the ability to simulate realistic multipath environments. So all the runs we did were approximately one day long. The receiver was static, of course, and before we started the measurements, uh, the DUT was in a position fixed mode and it was locked in GNSS. Next slide, please. Uh, regarding the atmospheric conditions, they were normal. We didn't introduce any kind of severe atmospheric conditions in the simulator or any other kind of interference apart from uh, multipath. Satellite clock and track errors were not applied either. And the measured values that we got from the packet and timing monitor device that we used were the one PPS absolute time error and the two-way time error, which is our PTP measurements. Uh, next slide, please. So what we used was the following. We used the GNSS signal generator with enough uh, channels, of course, to be able to simulate multipath. Uh, PRTC supporting PTP and 1PPS. As we said, it was capable of tracking GPSL1 and GLONSL1 frequencies. A 3D ray tracing software and a packet monitoring mo a timing monitor. Uh, next slide, please. So we can see our setup here. On the left, we have the one PPS measurement setup. And on the right, we have the PTP. There isn't any, we, we, didn't, we didn't run the tests at different times. The tests were run simultaneously. For the PTP, we had an Ethernet cable uh, from uh, connecting the packet timing monitor and the DUT. 
So that was our main setup. Next slide, please. So the environments that we we simulated were the following: San Francisco, Manhattan, and Shanghai. Uh, these three. Next slide, please. So here on the left, we can see the multipath environment in San Francisco. White lines are the line of sight signals. Blue lines are the diffracted signals. Uh, I made a mistake here. They're not refracted, they're diffracted. And red lines are the reflected signals. And on the right, we can see the scene itself. So it is a realistic representation of uh, San Francisco. Uh, next slide, please. So under open sky conditions, as we can see, the one PPS timer is well within the PRTC A limits. So we have applied a threshold of 100 nanoseconds in our measurements. And we can see that we have an average, an absolute mean value of 28, 24.9 approximately nanoseconds for PPS measurements and 29.6 for PTP. And we can see that the PTP follows the same trend as the one PPS. Uh, and that's under open sky conditions. So next slide, please. So we can see that under multipath conditions, we see large deviations in our time error measurements. We see an absolute mean value of one PPS time error that is approximately 233.9 nanoseconds, which is almost twice the threshold of 100 nanoseconds. We see a very big maximum to minimum value, which is 2.4 microns. And we also see that the PTP follows a similar trend, so we see a very big deviation in our errors. And for most of the time, it is well above the 100 nanosecond threshold that we have applied. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the second scene was Manhattan. Uh, on the left, again, you can see the multipath environment, and on the right, you see the 3D scene. So in Manhattan, it was quite challenging for the DUT to track. So the position we chose was somehow a compromise between being able to track signals and also being able to see the multipath effect in the DUT. Uh, next slide, please. Under open sky conditions, Results look very good, well within the PRTCA limits again, with a mean value of an absolute mean value of 6.4 nanoseconds for the one PPS measurement and 1.2 nanoseconds for the two way time error or the PTP measurements. Uh, next slide, please. So, when it comes to multipath, we see that uh, the time error is almost during the whole run within our threshold. But nevertheless, we see that the maximum minimum value is 580 nanoseconds, and we have a minimum uh, approximately at the end of the scenario, which is, which is approximately minus 436 nanoseconds. And as you know, the multipath environment depends on, of course, on the geometry and also on the satellites that set and rise. So we had a mean value of 32 nanoseconds through the run, but we see that at some points we had very big deviations in our time error measurements. Again, the PTP follows the same trend. Uh, next slide, please. So for this run, we also extracted some data from our DUT so the GNSS status on the left shows, shows us the status of the DGT under open sky conditions. We see an ellipsoidal height of 52.5 meters, which under multipath conditions was 14.6 meters. So we see a big deviation in height. We also see obscuration. So we have 17 available satellites under open sky conditions, but only six under multipath conditions. We also have very quite low 
carried the noise ratios under multipath conditions, while we have quite good carrier to noise ratio values for open sky conditions. And pseudo range residuals, as you can see as well, are quite high, quite large for, uh, for the multipath environment. Next slide, please. So the last scene was Shanghai. Again, on the left, you can see the multipath environment during the simulation. And on the right is the scene we used for our measurements. And next slide, please. Open sky conditions again, very good results. Nothing to worry about. Our 1PPS and PTP are well within the pre-RTCA limits. Next slide, please. Uh, 1 PPS now, well, as you can see, we have an absolute mean value of 94.3 approximately nanoseconds with a minimum of minus 434. And as you can see, there is an obvious degradation in the time error measurements. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't have we don't have PTP results for this scene. Probably the Ethernet cable was was not working i don't know what happened but we didn't see any results on the ptp side but again we can see how multipath affects the measurements so next slide please again the gnss status here shows similar characteristics uh for example pseudo range residuals under multipath conditions are quite large when compared to the pseudo range residuals under open sky conditions uh, current noise ratio values as well. Obscuration is always uh, present. Uh, the height didn't deviate that much this time, but there are some indications of multipaths as the ones I just described. Uh, next slide, please. So we all know that time recovery is crucial in telecom applications, and we saw that multipath can degrade the performance of GNSS-based PRTCs. Uh, table one shows a very basic quantitative analysis of the results. What's important is to focus on the percentages. So on the absolute differences, we can see that uh, for San Francisco, for example, under multipath conditions, we saw an increase in the absolute mean one PPS time error of 939% while for Manhattan, that was 502%, and for Shanghai, 561%. Uh, moreover, uh, in San Francisco, again, uh, the PTP measurements showed 1,104% increase in the PTP time error for San Francisco, 2,126% uh, for Manhattan, which shows a big increase in the in, which shows a clear effect of uh, multipath. Uh, and next slide, please. So regarding what's next, and regarding only multipath, what we want to do is we need to conduct measurements from live sky from live multipath environments and compare them against the simulated results that we just got also have some measurements on L2 and L5 frequencies if available. And we want to extend these whole tests and include spoofing, interference, uh, some atmospheric events, some severe scintillation effects, as well as uh, GNSS outage tests. So that's pretty much what we want to do from, uh, from, from, from now on. And last slide, I have included a few links on the references I used. Thanks again for listening and thanks for hosting me, guys. Thank you very much, Akis. Very interesting talk. So we have a, a little time now for questions. Uh, I want to remind attendees that you can can uh, submit questions that will be answered by the presenters, even if we don't have time today, you'll get those uh, answers later. Um, so continue to submit your questions as you have them, have them please. 
Um, just a, a quick reminder that we are planning WSTS 2021 as a face-to-face uh, uh, -face meeting. We, we're already set in Denver for next year, and it is less than a year away. It is it is March of 2021. Um, so let's take a few questions. Um, the first question I'd like to address to Karen O'Donoghue. Um, can, can you give a wild guess as to when the new architecture will be ready and approved for installation? Um, well, I, I think there'll be, it'll be more solid by the end of the year. Um, I, I think the, the, the protocols are there and it's going to be up to the uh, folks implementing the products to really help define what that architecture is. Thank you. Um, and, and, uh, just a quick question to uh, Josh Clanton. Um, is there a public web page for your library or for reference about this work? For example, is there uh, a library for for the uh, the software available, or is that going to be available? Uh, Josh, perhaps you're muted. I don't know if you can come back on and answer. Okay, let, let's move on. I, I think uh, that can be answered remotely via email. Um, can you hear me, Mark? Hello? Yeah, I hear you now. Yes. Okay, yeah, I'm not sure what happened. I was unmuted on my end. I don't know if something happened on, on the web or something. Um, yes, to answer your question, uh, the I'll have to get with my sponsors on DHS uh, for how they're planning to release that. Uh, we have delivered uh, to them. Uh, I'm not sure what their plans for rolling that out are, and we can uh, also bring this up in the in the working group as well and talk about it there. But um, I'm, I'm sure they will publicly uh, announce that and release that at some point. I'm not sure what their schedule is. But just the information about, that you presented today is that available in some public web web page? Um, Outside of the charts, uh, not yet. Uh, I can see about publishing some additional info on that. We do have some uh, documentation on the software and things like that that might be available. So I'll, I will check with them and see what, uh, what we can get out there for you. Okay. Thank you, Josh. Mm -hmm. Question to Doug Arnold. Um, the, the additional exchange of messages with a uh, key exchange server won't that add additional time delay and will that is that going to be considered in in the master slave delay offset uh, no actually uh, these messages all the exchange of cookies and and, and key IDs and that sort of thing ha happens with signaling messages that are not uh, not part of the event messages um, that are time stamped and are used to calculate the network delay. So they happen beforehand, kind of in the background. Uh, it might it might lengthen the, the kind of setup time to get going when you first turn it on uh, by a small amount, but uh, it should not make the uh, the protocol any less accurate. No, well, thank you. Thank you. Um, question for Andreas. Um, the uh, the net quick model over the simpler Klobuchar model. Um, what is the practical improvement in these two models? And, and can you say a little about that? Well, in the can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, in the in in my list of references, there is a reference made to the official or of the documentation by the European Union, which is about about 100 pages or so. How the net quick model works. What we have uh, heard from people, it is applied already today in the one GNSS receiver used in the timing community from one company. And this is why I know that it really works better than the other, it gives good improvement. Um, it is critical probably to implement it into low cost GNSS DO or the GPS DO, or GPS Galileo receivers in small form factor receivers because of the computational load. But also there, um, GMV, our company, has 
prepare the paper and if the person if i see the uh, if i see the question in the mail i will send a link to this paper great thank you very much um one last question for for uh akis uh you know i i see how you model the, the multipath in these urban environments it, it it's sort of stunning to me how it must be very difficult to do that how how i mean if if you were asked to set up a multipath environment in a totally new environment how long would that take how hard is that can can that just be done or does that take a long process uh well it depends on the difficulty that uh, well the scenes that we that you saw in the presentation were uh, will take some time to be modeled they're not easy uh, and usually we don't do it we only do on-site very basic ones if it seems like Shanghai or Manhattan or San Francisco we will ask from a company that we cooperate to, to do it for us I see otherwise it is very complicated I would say for for you know a simple user to do it okay well that's, so it could, that's, could that's helpful that. I want to thank all of today's speakers. I think we had a very excellent session on uh, timing, security, resilience, and GNSS issues. Thank you particularly to Meinberg for sponsoring this webinar. Thank you to Addis and, and all the people that made this happen and did all the work to make it happen. Um, uh, just a re quick reminder, attendees will receive an email with the slides and a link to the recording. and please uh, save the date for WSDS 2021. So uh, with that, I'd like to close the webinar.